what should we mean by justice as a way to start our conversation? Okay, so if that's the simple question, I'm looking forward to the hard ones. Yes. yes. So justice is traditionally defined in terms of not harming anybody and of giving people what one owes them. So that there's a certain association with negative duties. So justice is not so much about helping other people, being beneficent, benevolent, and so on, but rather about uh, not harming other people, not in any way reducing their standard of living, taking anything away from them, breaking promises towards them, and so on. Now, uh, in recent years and recent centuries, one might say, uh, an aspect of justice has become increasingly important that is often referred to as social justice. And social justice concerns the design of social institutions because one can, of course, harm people and deny them what they are owed, not only directly face to face, but also through the design of social institutions, of rules that govern the life of a society or the world at large that are unjust, that expropriate things from some people for the benefit of other people. So unjust rules are just one increasingly prominent way in which people run the risk of harming other people. So that's a very general definition of, of justice. And, and is it something, uh, is it a definition which applies uh, uh, throughout time or is it something which is uh, of validity simply for, for, for today? Uh, well, obviously, conceptions of justice have changed over time. So we are now thinking, at least internationally, increasingly in terms of human rights. But human rights are not a construct that was prominent in the thinking, for example, of the old Romans or the Greeks or the uh, old Chinese. So there are changes in how we conceive of justice. But I think it's also important that when we think about justice, we think about it at as uh, eternal, or at least as quasi-eternal. So we ask ourselves whether our conception of justice is one that would have been applicable to, would have made reasonable demands upon people in earlier ages. Now, not perhaps all the way to the Stone Ages, that's why I'm saying quasi-eternal, but certainly back to Roman times. We think, if we are really convinced that slavery is wrong, and slavery is an injustice, and it harms the people who are being enslaved, then uh, we are willing to project that judgment back in time and say, well, slavery was just as wrong and just as harmful in ancient Rome and ancient Greece as it is in, let's say, the early 19th century United States situation. And, and the definition that you gave us uh, of justice as the, uh, at the beginning of our conversation, would you say that it is really a definition which is built around these quasi-eternal principles of justice? Well. Uh, we have to distinguish between the concept of justice and various conceptions of justice. And I think it's part of the concept of justice that it's not something that varies day to day. Mm -hmm. Justice is not some sort of a, a, an agreement that people make and then when bargaining power shifts and some parties become stronger and, and others become weaker, why well, then we work out another conception of justice that fits the new reality. So justice has a certain eternity, a certain eternal validity, and I think it would uh, not be, uh, you would not qualify as giving a conception of justice if you said, well, now I've become more powerful or you've become less powerful, so now the just arrangement between us is a different arrangement. So justice is precisely not uh, a mere accommodation of the interests of the various parties where each one concedes what they find most advantageous to concede given the bargaining power of oneself and the other. Mm -hmm. and, and, and of course, I mean, historically, uh, uh, thinking about justice has taken place at the national level and, and essentially for the national level. And in the past uh, uh, 20 years, in fact, you have been one of the key voices in terms of trying to think about justice at the global level. So why do we have to think about justice at the global level now, and what are the, the differences and the similarities in terms of uh, justice at the national level and justice at the global level? Yeah, so the main reason why we have to increasingly pay attention to questions of global justice is because the rules that govern our day-to-day -day interactions are increasingly supranational rules. Mm 
So go back in time a few centuries, and you would say that most of what went on in inter interactions between human beings, economic transactions, for example, employment relations, whatever, was governed by rules that were at the most at the national level. But today, global rules are much stronger. There are much more, many more of them, and they increasingly preempt and constrain the rules at the nation state level. These global rules are incredibly influential. We all know that, the rules of the WTO and so on. And uh, we need to think about these rules because they have so much influence in moral terms. We have to ask ourselves, are these rules harming people? Are these rules giving people what they are owed and so on? So that's why it's become increasingly important. Now, the difference between the national and the global levels, of course, is one is of subject matter, which I think is somewhat less important. But the more important difference is that the kinds of moral intuitions that you can call upon within a national community are not necessarily available uh, at the global level. So it, it could be that when you design a conception of justice for France, that you can draw on a certain shared history, shared values, uh, the French Revolution, let's say, and some of the great heroes of French intellectual history. Uh, but these people may not be even known, let alone uh, respected and revered in other parts of the world. And we couldn't ask the rest of the world to accept the conception of global justice that is heavily focused upon French traditions and French thinking. So we have to look for common elements. We have to find a perhaps thinner conception of justice, one that is widely shareable, that may not be one that we can all agree is complete, but it's one that we can all agree is at least the core of what a reasonable conception of global justice would look like. And we have to try to work with that weak conception of global justice to shape our global or supranational institutions in such a way that at least the most severe, most obvious harms to people are avoided. So essentially, you're telling us that uh, at the national level, there is a, a strong sense of uh, moral community, partly because there is a sense of shared history, which doesn't exist at the global level. Yes, I would say that's at least true for many countries, right? Obviously, it's not true of every single country. There are some countries that are artificial constructs with great cultural diversity within them and so on. But most countries, and certainly most of the developing countries, uh, the developed countries, I'm sorry, that have been around for quite a while, like France, have a significant history, a significant body of traditions, of thinking about justice, and a certain commonality of uh, uh, experiencing morality, of thinking about morality, that you can draw upon and can design an a ambitious conception of justice around. And that's all right. It's all right for countries to have ambitious conceptions of justice, maybe ones that are diverse, that differ from the ones that other countries have. So there need not be one correct theory that fits all countries. But the problem is that at the global level, we don't have any kind of complete theory that would be widely acceptable and so have to work with something thinner. Which leads me to the next question. In a way, you are telling us that uh, it's easier to think about uh, principles of justice and to implement principles of justice if we already have a sense of moral community at the national level. Uh, but of course, the difficulty at the global level is that this sense of global moral community that doesn't exist. So how do we first identify the principles which would uh, be uh, you know, uh, usable uh, at the global level and how do we go about implementing them? Yeah, I think a good starting point is to look at the things that have been common themes in the moralities of all the different cultures. So there are common elements. The golden rule, for example, is an element that has been developed independently in different cultures. And also the conception of human rights, even though, as I said earlier, the concept of human rights is a new concept, but the idea that everybody should have uh, the possibility of uh, being well nourished, of having their fundamental basic needs met, of being able to worship uh, freely, of being able to express themselves freely, of being able to have some role in the governance of their community. These sorts of ideas are ideas that are not partisan to any particular country or culture, but rather have emerged independently in pretty much all the different cultures of the world. 
And so they form a nucleus that's also expressed, of course, in the human rights documents that have emerged over the last 40, 60 years or so, 60 years, uh, since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which show that uh, countries are willing to subscribe at least to this sort of minimal conception of justice. And if we can agree that this minimal conception of justice that gives all human beings a certain standing, a certain dignity, a certain set of basic claims on the rest of humankind, that, that they are part of any more ambitious conception of global justice might, one might want to construct. And if we can also agree that they are weighty claims, substantial, that they are likely to trump anything else that one might want to add in the future to such a conception of global justice, then we have the starting point that you were asking about, we, a starting point where we can say, we don't know exactly what a full conception of global justice would or could look like, but we have enough to go on at least to have a critical a standpoint from which we can look at existing global institutions and say how they should be, in what direction they should be reformed. Uh, Thomas, we are, we are talking about global justice as if global justice was more or less the same thing than compared to international justice, but uh, I would assume that you, 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 in, your, in, your, in your mind, international justice and global justice are quite different. And in yes. fact, uh, over time, your, your focus has been very, very much on global justice rather than on international justice. So what is the difference between international justice and, and global justice? And why do you feel that, uh, and this is really one of the key messages uh, of your work, why do you think that it's much more important to focus on global justice than on international justice? Yeah, international justice has been around for centuries. It's a, a very, very long tradition of international justice going back all the way to the ancient times. International justice is simply uh, the justice of the interactions among states. So states are interacting with each other, they sign treaties, they invade each other perhaps, they fight wars and, and uh, have competing claims over resources and territory. And international justice tries to address uh, these interactions and the rules that states are permitted or not to impose upon themselves to regulate their conflicting claims and conflicts. So here, states are the players. States are the ones who have claims that the subjects of international law. And that's very different with global justice. In the case of global justice, it's individual human beings who are the claimants, who are the ones who have uh, the rights and who are the subjects of the theory. So we are trying to work out an international theory, a theory of how international institutions ought to be designed that is responsive not to the claims and interests of states, but rather to the claims and interests of individual human beings. And that's partly uh, of, I mean, partly the sort of post-enlightenment modern era that we are thinking that the ultimate units of moral concern are always human beings. States are important if and insofar as they are important to individual human beings. They don't have any importance in and of themselves, but only insofar as individuals identify with them, individuals are protected by them, individual interests are advanced by them. Now, global justice is quite different from international justice in that once you take the account of the claims of individuals, you will impose very different, want to impose very different rules on the world. You will assess the rules that we have quite differently. Rules can be very convenient for states in the sense of governments, for example, states may work out a system where they say, well, it's wrong to interfere in the internal affairs of other states. That's nice for all governments because they can do what they want in their own territory, but that's not a very good solution for individuals because they can easily be subject to uh, oppressive and corrupt regimes that exploit them, suppress them, kill many of them, and so forth. So if we make human beings the be-all and end-all of justice, we get a very different perspective, a very different take on the assessment of supranational institutional arrangements. So if we focus on, on, on global justice rather than focusing on uh, international justice, the principles of justice at the global level are going to be different because the, the beneficiaries and the actors uh, uh, for whom you are working are going to be different, and I guess the institutions expressing and uh, implementing and, and protecting this sense of justice are going to be uh, different, right? Yes, 
Yeah, absolutely. They're going to be quite different. And we are asking ourselves with the conception of global justice, uh, for example, if you follow uh, what I said earlier about human rights uh, being a nucleus, a kind of core of a conception of global justice, then our first question is always going to be, uh, how can we uh, design and reform supranational institutional arrangements in such a way that we improve the fulfillment of human rights, that, that human rights are better realized than they are realized in the world as it is. If you look at the same question from the standpoint of international justice, you will say, how can we improve institutions at the supranational level in such a way that states enjoy greater autonomy, are better protected against predators, stronger states in the neighborhood, and so forth. And of course, there's some overlap between these two concerns, but the social institutions, the supranational institutions that will optimally solve the first problem may not be optimal for the second and vice versa. So it really makes a significant difficult difference which conception of justice or which kind of justice you're applying. Is it possible uh, when we go from international justice to global justice, is it possible both when it comes to principles and to institutions to build on uh, what has been the, what is the legacy of uh, international justice to really somehow midwife global justice? Yeah, I think to some extent it's possible. So some of the concerns uh, that uh, states have traditionally had and that one might attribute to states uh, plausibly are concerns that can be justified by appeal to the individuals. So for example, having a certain degree of autonomy within the state, being left alone, not being uh, interfered with by other stronger states, self-determination as it's often called, that's a very important value in international justice, and it will remain a very important value in global justice. But even here, there is a difference, namely that with international justice, you would say, well, whoever is in power should have the should enjoy this right to self-determination. Self-determination really means that the ruler can determine him or herself, the ruler or rulers can determine him or her or themselves, uh, how this country shall be governed without interference from foreigners. But uh, if you take the global justice paradigm, you will say, well, no, it shouldn't be the ruler. It should be the people. The country should be governed in the interests of the people. And if the people happen to rule, if the country happens to be governed in a broadly speaking democratic way, then indeed self-determination in the traditional sense is quite appropriate. But self-determination has very little value. The traditional international justice type of self-determination has very little value if it is exercised by somebody like Sani Abacha or Mobutu Sese Seko or Suharto or whoever, Gaddafi, whoever your favorite dictator might be. So people uh, are the very core of the sense of global justice and of the demands associated with it. That's right. Uh, another question, Tom. Uh, you, you, you know, clearly this global justice agenda is, you know, very much an outgrowth of what has been the culture of the, of the Enlightenment, right? Yes. So how do we go about this in a world which is somehow shifting towards Asia, towards countries which some somehow are themselves very much attached to a much more traditional version of national sovereignty and therefore of what could be, uh, you know, the world order to come? So how do we go about? negotiating this evolution and bringing new versions of, of sovereignty of rights into the, the picture? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think there are two things to be said about it. Uh, one is that uh, we have to look for these debates to uh, happen in those countries themselves. So I think it's not uh, ultimately productive to come in from the outside and uh, to say to a culture as ancient and as venerable as the Chinese culture, for example. Look, guys, you know, nice try for 5,000 years, but you have to start over because we've got some better ideas about how to run countries and how to run the world. Uh, that will obviously not be a, a winning way. You have to look at the internal debates, really understand something, learn something about Chinese traditions, Chinese thinking, and find the kinds of levers, the kinds of uh, thoughts which are continuous with our Western tradition. Sort of say it in a Chinese way, if you can, find commonalities, and also, of course, be prepared to learn from what the Chinese tradition can teach us about uh, conceptions of justice. 
The second point is that uh, one has to really focus on the essentials. Let me give you one important example that I think is important in the context of the Asian values debate, which you were alluding to. The example is this, that uh, most people in the West, when they think about human rights, they think about courtrooms. They say, well, having a human right means that there's some courtroom somewhere, some, you know, you go to the police, you make a complaint, you come before a judge, the judge decides, and you get your right. Now, that's something that uh, many people in Asian cultures find alien. They don't want a culture that, like the United States, where everybody, when anything goes wrong, is just looking for somebody to sue. Right? They say, we want to regulate our differences in a consensual way. We want to, to sort of talk with each other. We don't want to run to some umpire or arbitrator whenever uh, we feel hurt or we feel that something is wrong. And uh, I think we should be very sympathetic to that, and we should think of human rights more narrowly. We should say, what does it really mean for a human right to be realized? Does it really require that there are police stations and courts everywhere that you can go to when you feel that uh, your right has been in any way infringed? Not really. What it really means is that you have secure access to the object of the right. So take a concrete example, the right to have enough to eat. So that right, you might say, well, China may be able to fulfill that right, to realize it in the whole country. Everybody has enough to eat. Nobody is really going hungry without there being a legal system that backs that right up. So yes, there's no place you can go uh, to claim your right in case you are hungry. But on the other hand, there's no place that you need to go to because there is enough food. Everybody has a job or there are pensions or there are other systems, other institutions that make sure that everybody has enough to eat. So this is how I want to conceive of human rights. Human rights basically require that everybody has secure access to the object of the human right. And whether that is achieved through an elaborate legal system or through a certain organization of the economy and so on, that's secondary. That's not something that itself has to be packaged into the human right in question. But, but, but in, in a way, it's the uh, optimistic or happy scenario, the, the, the scenario that you are uh telling us about at the moment, uh, and, and clearly it's about achieving and recognizing the universality of, of human rights within the context of uh, plurality or pluralism, right? But uh, uh, as you mentioned, you know, uh, if uh, human rights are, are the essentials on which we should focus, I mean, these human rights about uh, uh, economic and social rights, cultural rights, civic and uh, civil and, and political rights, and it's not always possible somehow to, to find this happy Uh, relationship between universality and, and, and plurality or pluralism. So when, when uh, conflicts arise, how do we go about uh, uh, finding this happy relationship between universality and pluralism? Yeah, I mean, when conflicts arise, I think uh, one move that may be unavoidable in those cases is a move of contraction. That you say, well, if a particular human right that we believe in very strongly is contested in many countries, then we should not at this point insist on the inclusion of that right in the list of human rights that we make the precondition for accepting states as being in good standing. So for example, we will not say that uh, anybody who doesn't have a parliamentary democracy is excluded from uh, the community of nations, uh, is not uh, allowed to be a full member in international organizations and so on. That would be too high a standard for now. Maybe in the long run, uh, we want to aspire to that. But for the moment, I think we need to contract our notion of human rights in such a way that we focus on the things that are widely accepted as essential. I think it's widely accepted as essential that there be some form of democratic participation, but it may be weaker than uh, parliamentary democracy that there be some form of freedom of expression, but again, it may be uh, weaker than having a completely free press on the Anglophone model. And I think with regard to social and economic rights, we are actually in better shape in that there's very widespread agreement that the basic human needs uh, must be met insofar as they can be met in every state and also by international institutional arrangements insofar as they impact people's ability to fend for themselves, to meet their needs. Uh, focusing on global justice, does it mean that we should abandon altogether 
uh, what has been at the core of international justice or not? Or can we, you know, can we bring the two things together? Or does it mean that we should forget altogether on interstate uh, justice, philosophy, and so on? No, no, I think we should uh, emphasize the continuities as much as we possibly can. And uh, we should work for gradual changes in the direction of uh, a more global justice friendly institutional design. So the example that I gave earlier of self-determination is a wonderful example for answering your question. Uh, traditionally, it was conceived that whoever rules uh, is determining the fate of the country. It's an insider, the person in power or the group in power. And the outsiders should butt out. They should not be involved. They should not try to interfere, or intervene in the internal affairs of the country. Now, that's fine, but as I said, we have to refine that a little bit. We have to say that these protections should not be given to any old ruler or ruling elite. These protections are deserved uh, by governments insofar as they really represent the will and the interests of the people. And if that connection between the people and their rulers becomes tenuous, like in the cases I mentioned, in those cases, uh, self-determination hasn't got much value. And that goes, in one sense, it goes absolutely against the traditional sense of international justice, which was that the equality of states demanded that you don't look behind uh, how appropriate their government may be. You just Governments recognize each other in a kind of gentleman's agreement, and the dictatorships deal with the fascists and the socialists and whoever you might be, uh, you all are equals in the international arena and recognize each other as equals. And, you know, you can be socialist, I can be fascist, you can be democratic, and so on. And that we have to move away from and say, no, in the end, it is for the sake of the people. It's in the people's interest that countries enjoy self-determination. And in those cases where it isn't, for example, in a case like Burma, in those cases, self-determination really has no value, mm -hmm. has no standing. But, but of course, you know, for this, uh, for this agenda of global justice to go forward, it needs uh, advocates and advocates beyond philosophy and philosophers. So in your, and I know that in the context of your work, uh, you, you interact a lot with uh, the UN system, with practitioners and so on, with, with member states and so on. Do you feel that uh, uh, beyond the, 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 in, the intellectual traction, that uh, the, the agenda of global justice has now. Do you feel that uh, uh, member states, uh, UN organizations, are open to really the idea of going beyond international justice in normative terms, in, in policy terms, and so on? Yeah, uh, I think there's definitely a willingness to go beyond international justice, but one has to be very careful because that willingness is not always, or maybe not even often, inspired by the same sort of moral sense that inspires me. So it's not often about we want to protect people better or something like that. It's often we want to have a better chance to implement our own interests. So strong states have uh, certainly exploited this idea of uh, a people-focused conception of justice in order to prosecute their own interests. So they say, uh, when they have certain oil-rich countries that are badly governed, they say, well, look at this injustice. Look at what is happening here. These uh, brutal dictators are suppressing the people, and what we should do is we should help liberate the people. Now, I'm all in favor of liberating the people, but uh, it is telling that this eagerness on the part of uh, great powers to liberate oppressed people is very strongly focused on countries that are resource-rich, and nobody, to my, to my knowledge, is interested at all in liberating the Burmese, for example, right? Mm -hmm. The Burmese have been suffering terribly under a horrible dictatorship, uh, but there isn't uh, quite the resource wealth in Burma that would make it lucrative for great powers to pay attention to that injustice. But if the injustice happens in Libya, or if it happens in uh, Iraq, then, of course, it's a whole different story. Again, Syria is, is a good example. Syria. Not very interesting. People don't really want to go there. What's the point? All you can liberate there is people, and there isn't a lot of oil. And, and, and also, in, in a way, one could argue that this uh, 
global just agenda is a, is a liberal Western agenda. So in your, in your conversations, in your debates, uh, in your interactions with uh, colleagues, philosophers, policymakers from, 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 you know, from developing countries in Asia, in Africa, and so on and so on, how do they view uh, the, your, your plea for global justice? I mean, do they, uh, you know, and, and do they give you ideas to, uh, you know, regarding how to go beyond the fact that it is partly uh, a liberal Western agenda? Yeah, I, I think what I find in the developing world is, of course, that suspicion that you are in, that you're suggesting. That suspicion is certainly there, and uh, I think the best way to deal with that is just to uh, be very upfront about it and say, I share the suspicion, and I reject uh, this at least as much as you do, if not more so, because I am a member of the Western culture, and for me, it's it's sort of personally shameful to see uh, the the sort of uh, double standard with which countries uh, that uh, I have lived in and uh, that I feel I culturally belong to are dealing with uh, situations, the kind of double standard that I just outlined. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is uh, to uh, highlight, again, the positive and to say, well, we can keep clear. We don't really have to be, of course, anything can be abused. Anything you say in the intellectual world can be abused and can be used for bad purposes. But we can at least try to make as clear as possible what we are advocating and what we are not advocating. And we can show uh, it by making our own theory clear and criticizing very clearly uh, some of the policies that Western countries are pursuing. We can distance the theory of global justice from these uh, somewhat dubious uses of such theories. And we can also, as a further point, uh, point to the great potential that this sort of theorizing about justice has for internal politics in developing countries. So developing countries, India, China are examples, uh, are often could profit greatly from some of the transparency, the concern for individual rights and so on, that are part and parcel of my theorizing or many people's theorizing about global justice. And so to say that uh, we have to have uh, more democratic institutions, more transparent institutions in China, in India, uh, more of a way for individuals to participate. It's not enough that the government just provides people with uh, food and so on and so forth. It's also important that the government be, uh, be transparent, that it be government by the people, for the people. And these sorts of ideas have a tremendous power within developing countries. And I think that is another way in which one can show that these are valuable ideas that shouldn't simply be dismissed just because certain Western powers are abusing them, taking advantage of them in the wrong way. But implicitly, when we, when we think or when we try to think about global justice, somehow we are calling for a greater uh, sense of social and economic and political integration. I mean, basically, that's what we have in mind. So the question is, I mean, is it truly possible to achieve greater and, and, and uh, uh, you know, more, I mean, better uh, social, economic, and political integrations while keeping, uh, you know, uh, in place uh, the, the, the structures having to do with the nation state? I mean, you know, how do we achieve greater uh, social, economic, and better integration while having the nation state still really uh, in place and uh, being the ruler of the time. Yeah, so it's, it's entirely right. We want more global integration, and we want that because modern technologies, modern uh, ways of life, uh, the modern economy simply make that necessary. If we continue all to puddle along in our respective nation states according to our own uh, principles, then uh, we will ignore uh, ever greater externalities that our conduct inflicts upon other countries, and we, have, we would then be caught in a massive collective action problem that will uh, really seriously diminish our chances even to see the end of this millennium, let alone uh, to go beyond it. So I think globalization in the sense of closer global integration is a necessity. And it will just simply automatically happen, uh, given the existing technologies and so on. Now, the question is, of course, how it will happen. Which globalization will we have? Will we have a globalization that will be in the interests of all human beings, or will it be a globalization heavily dominated by a few strong states? 
And then secondly, as you were asking, will it be a globalization in which states will retain a great deal of their power and autonomy, or will it be a globalization in which states will gradually fade away? Now, on that second question, uh, I think that we should fight for a globalization that will gradually make states fade into the background. I don't want states to fade from the scene altogether. I think states, these political units, are very important in enabling uh, populations to maintain a common culture and uh, to be different from one another. We don't want the whole world to be America, to be a melting pot in which uh, cultures merge into one and so on. It's a wonderful thing that we have alternative models, that we have alternative sets of ideas. And uh, what I have in mind is something more like the European Union, where uh, France, for example, has a very distinctive culture, maintains that culture. Uh, the, uh, the, the art, uh, the novels, uh, the movies in France are distinctive, continue to be distinctive, different from the rest of Europe. I mentioned France not just because it's your country, but also because it is the most distinctive country in the European Union, the one that has uh, achieved, I think, to the greatest extent, the maintaining of its own personality and its, its own sort of culture, and is also most consciously uh, pursuing that goal. And I think this is wonderful. Europe would be much poorer if we didn't have, uh, if everything became sort of on the Deutsche Bank model uh, from Hammerfest down to Sicily. So it's good that we have these separate culture. It's good that we have uh, political units like states. But why does it have to be only that one unit? Why can't we have several units, like uh, the country, uh, provinces, uh, above uh, entities like the European Union or the African Union or something like that? So a multiplicity of units that are allowing people to shield themselves a little bit against the encroachment of the rest of the world maintain separate cultures, separate communities, but none of them so powerful or so uh, invested with patriotic sentiment that uh, wars can easily break out uh, and so on. So a kind of globalized European Union would be, I think, my best model for where I want the world to be 50 or But, but, but uh, Tom, isn't it the paradox? In a way, you, you said earlier that in order for, 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 for us to have a better, uh, greater form of social, economic, and political integration, somehow the state has to fade away a little bit. Yet at the same time, and this is one of the lessons of the European Union, in order for uh, integration beyond the state to happen, we need effective, powerful state. And of course, while it, 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 it's a tool for this to happen, it becomes also an obstacle because then, you know, uh, the organization can be hampered by, by this state. So how do, we, uh, how do we manage this kind of uh, paradox? Yeah, so we need powerful states uh, in order to make the transition, but we don't necessarily need very powerful states at the end or be beyond the transition. So if you, again, think about the future of the European Union, obviously that's unknown. I'm just, I'm not trying to make any predictions. I'm just saying how it might go, right? In the moment, uh, the states within the European Union still dwarf the European Union itself in terms of their power. And you can see this very easily, not just in the military domain, but most clearly in the economic domain. So the state budget of a country like Germany or France is many times larger than the entire budget of the European Union. Now, that's something that uh, doesn't need to be that way, right? And I think it will gradually become the case that some governmental functions will be absorbed by the European Union, and that will come with an increasing budget. So my prediction is, or at least my hope, but also my prediction, that the ratio between the European budget and, let's say, the German or the French budget, that that ratio will climb and that over time the European Union will be as powerful economically as uh, its largest member states. And there will be more functions, like for example, a common foreign policy, wouldn't that be nice if we had that? Would be very, very helpful in dealing with things like uh, the crisis in the former Yugoslavia, for example, but also with other things like now the NATO operation in Libya and so on, it would be much, much simpler if instead of having all these different NATO countries, if we had a common voice in Europe that makes decisions like that, if necessary, by majority rule. 
So I hope that Europe will get its act together in these ways. And uh, it would then be a model of what I also hope to see at the global level, namely a hierarchy of nested political units where none of these levels is the privileged level, like we now have at the level of the nation state, where you might say 90% of all public funds uh, that are raised through taxes go to states. And then a little bit goes to provinces, a little bit goes to the European Union, and so on. It should be more evenly distributed over all these levels, both in terms of finance, but also in terms of political power, in terms of functions, and so on. So clearly, you, you, you think that uh, there are lessons uh, to be, to, that we can draw from, from the European Union. I mean, and, and I tend to agree with you, and, and clearly one of the key lessons is that uh, somehow um, the exercise of public policy at the regional level is, a, is, a, is an interesting one, and we should look into whether or not uh, public policy at the global level uh, is, is a serious uh, scenario for the future in terms of a better form of uh, integration. So if it is the case, I mean, in your view, and I know that you're very much interested in, so, in the, the, the practical accept, uh, aspects of your, uh, of, 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 or the practical implications of your of your feral thinking uh, you know if public policy at the global level is a, is a, is a scenario uh, that we have to take uh, seriously I mean what would be uh, the, the, the intellectual and policy challenges uh, and perhaps also political challenges for global policy to become a reality yeah I think the great challenge is uh, to make sure that the moral voice uh, is heard and that the moral imperatives, the moral values that we want to inject in this globalization process uh, really play a role. And here one needs something a little bit like judo. When uh, moral motivations are in the history of humankind and in the foreseeable future not going to be very powerful motivations. They are not going to play the dominant role in world affairs. That's just not going to happen anytime soon. But uh, we uh, who are thinking about the question moral terms and more specifically in terms of global justice, we have to try to collaborate with prudential forces in ways that divert these forces somewhat in a more moral direction. So the idea is this. I mean, the, the great powers uh, obviously are in one sense pro-globalization, one sense against uh, powers like the United States. Uh, on the one hand, they like globalization because they feel that there are all these externalities, all these threats that they need to control. The U.S. puts it very openly and says, uh, we are a nation with global interests. We have interests absolutely everywhere because we need to control resources, we need to control climate change, we need to control military technologies, we need to control pathogens, by, uh, you know, uh, bugs and uh, bacteria and viruses and so on. So we need to basically create a world in which all this stuff is under some sort of common supervision, in which station, nations can no longer just paddle along and, and North Korea style and just build their own nuclear arsenal and so on. And that's fundamentally right, but the question is, do we want this all to be run by the United States? And uh, no, we don't. And secondly, it's not going to happen. The Chinese are not going to allow it to happen. The Russians are not going to be happy with it and so on. And so in some way, we have to say to the US, look, if you want, uh, very understandably, if you want to have supervision of these things, if you want to protect yourself against those threats, then you have to give up something in exchange and be part of your own sovereignty, part of your own rapid pursuit of uh, your own self-interest. And you have to be willing, for example, to do something to mitigate international economic inequalities, and you have to do something also to relieve the anxieties that other countries are feeling in the face of your enormous military superiority. So it's a kind of uh, a negotiation where different countries have a great deal to gain, I think, from a negotiated settlement that will uh, restrict the sovereignty of states, what states can do unencumbered by other states. Uh, every state has much more to gain from other states giving up some of that sovereignty, then it has to lose from its own giving up some of that sovereignty. But of course, uh, progress in that direction, progress towards the greater frontier can still be blocked if states can't agree, if they don't find a good way to, and that's where morality can come in and can be uh, the kind of additional force 
that pushes things in the right direction by saying, let's say, to the U.S., look, you know, uh, maybe you can hold out for this better deal that you're hoping for, but it would not only uh, be dangerous for you to do that because no deal might then be forthcoming, but it's also immoral of you to do that. You shouldn't, morally speaking, you shouldn't hold out for a deal where you retain all these rights and then you are not participating in, for example, solving problems of hunger, solving problems of uh, the enormous disease burden, and so on and so forth. If you want to uh, make sure that we have a common control over risky and problematic uh, and dangerous areas in other countries, then you have to contribute something towards reducing risks and dangers for other people elsewhere in the world. In, in a way, Tom, you are describing a world in which you have a, a regional poles. You talked about the European Union, you talked about Asia, China, and, and the, the U.S. region. So then the question is, how do we go? First of all, one of the dangers is that, you know, these poles could be competing you know, in a self-defeating fashion. I mean, you know, the European project is partly uh, uh, a project designed to have European countries now too small to compete at the global level, to work together to be of importance at the global level. So one danger would be to have these regional poles competing together, and then it could be self-defeating for, for everybody. And then the second, the second difficulty, I, as I see it, is how do we go from these regional poles which are now emerging, even the U.S. is not strong enough anymore to, become, uh, to, to, be, to, to remain a global force, how do we go about, uh, how do we move from these regional poles to greater, better global integration. Yeah, I think you put your finger on exactly the, the problem because that is the other future ahead of us. The other future is one where you have blocks of relatively powerful, relatively wealthy countries. And these blocks are then uh, designing the rules governing the world in their own interest. And two thirds of the human population is shut out from these blocks and basically left to rot. And uh, that future is the one to be avoided. And it's, uh, in a sense, difficult to see in a pure negotiating bargaining equilibrium uh, why that isn't the future that we are now going towards. Now, uh, one thing is, of course, that I have some hope for uh, morality in the world. I have some hope that morality can make at least some difference. And uh, that could be, to some extent, fueled by the positive experience of the European Union. So that when people see the European Union as a model, and of course it is imperfect in many ways today, but uh, with some luck it will be a much more appealing model in let's say 10 or 20 years, they will say, well, why can't we, why, why really can't we have something like that everywhere? Do we really have to take this confrontational view that has dominated in Europe for most of its history, where some countries were powerful, others less powerful, the little guys were kicked around and so on. And then Europe kind of retooled itself and said, look, we can do it differently. We don't have to have little guys who get kicked around. We can all be one more or less happy family. And uh, there's enough there for everyone. So the realization that there's enough there for everyone, even globally speaking, I think could make a model like the European Union model more attractive, even though I'm under no illusion that uh, people will agree worldwide to share one another's fate in the sense that uh, we will work towards equality in average income in all countries. That's just not going to happen anytime soon. So there will be uh, different blocks, let's say the African Union with a much lower standard of living, but at the very least the African Union would be accepted as an equal partner in working out uh, the, f the common institutions that govern the whole world. That would be the, the hope there. Uh, one other thought, if I can, can add no, one more thought to this, uh, that is that uh, I think that uh, this idea that uh, nation states are, uh, might just sort of shut themselves off from one another is an idea and, and uh, the strong ones running the world and the weak ones essentially being rule takers uh, is one that is also in one sense made less likely by the fact that increasingly uh, the global competition is really truly global. It is one where people from different countries are competing against each other, and that inequality within countries is now rising. So there's much more of a commonality now between the rich in the various different countries and also among the poor in the very different countries.
So inequality, which used to be very heavily correlated with nationality and also with features such as gender and religion and language and uh, so on, is increasingly becoming what I call anonymized. That is to say, it gets separated off from these various features of persons. And you just find that there are rich people who are black, who are women, who are uh, of uh, Muslims, let's say, different religions and so on, poor people. And the rich people live in all different countries, and the poor people live in all different countries. And that, again, makes it somewhat more difficult to uh, come to a world where uh, the rich countries, so to speak, circle the wagons and say, OK, we'll run the world, and you two-thirds out there will just have to do as we say. Three, three follow-up uh, points, uh, Tom. I mean, on this issue of, uh, of uh, uh, growing disparities, uh, uh, among, I mean, between the rich and poor. I mean, isn't it ironic in a way that uh, uh, the, 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 the global justice agenda is, is, uh, is rising? I mean, it's really clearly uh, on the map, and yet somehow we are having more and more uh, trouble trying to achieve uh, justice at the, lo at the local level, partly because this uh, gap is growing between rich and poor people. So uh, just for you to keep in mind so, so that we can go back, go back to this issue. But just to, 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 to go back to the issue of Europe and so on, I mean, in, in a way, you know, you are, you are telling us that there is something seductive about the European project. But, you know, one could also argue that the European project is, is a very parochial one. It's all about Europe. And, and, and one of the... Uh, expressions of the fact that it's quite uh, all about Europe is that we don't have uh, a European foreign policy. In fact, you know, we, Europe doesn't have a global policy. So how can Europe be a model when well, in fact it's very parochial, all about Europe, and not really um, uh, concerned with, with uh, global policy demand? First of all, that's the first point. And other point, you know, when, when you think about the triangle or the, 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 the relationship between uh, Europe, uh, China, and the U.S. And when you think about, for instance, uh, the U.S. and Europe, clearly we share the same values, we have the same political culture, and yet it seems to me that we are less and less speaking the same language. On the other hand, China and America, although they don't have the same political values, they don't have the same political culture, they more and more speak the same language, which is the language of power and status. So how do you go about this? So why don't we begin with this, and then we'll go back to the tension between Global justice and local justice. Local justice, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so this is, uh, uh, again, I think that when I speak of using Europe as a model, you say Europe is all about Europe and the Europeans and so on. The European Union is all about Europe. And that, that is, of course, right, it is. But, uh, again, that I don't think makes it any less suitable as a model because the African Union could be all about Africa. Right? And maybe they would also initially not have any kind of strong foreign policies, though I hope that they would, and I hope they would be able to bring their collective interest and also their African culture into the mix. But uh, it's the, the, what makes Europe a suitable model is not that it itself has a global vision, but rather that if you think of Europe for a moment as if it were the whole world, it gives you a vision of what the future world might look like. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, a, if it were the whole world, then it wouldn't need a foreign policy. There wouldn't be anything that it would need to relate to. So uh, that said, of course, I completely agree with you that uh, Europe needs a common foreign policy, and it would be a more effective model if it were willing to help others to follow its example. So again, take another example, Latin America, right? If, if Europe, uh, which is connected with Latin America uh, by language and, and culture, Spanish and Portuguese and so on, if, uh, if Europe could have forged close ties with Latin America and could help uh, the Latin American continent uh, through better trade ties and so on to become a little more independent from the United States and to form a kind of European-like trading arrangement that would, could interact with the United States and the European Union more as an equal, that would be a wonderful step forward and would uh, ensure that we don't go down the road of that dystopia that we discussed earlier, where we have basically large parts of the world essentially excluded, that would just deliver resources to the rich parts, but would not have a high standard of living and would not play any kind of political role. Uh, that's to be avoided, and I think that can be avoided if Europe uh, is a, a little bit more outgoing in 
marketing its model to uh, up-and-coming regions like Latin America. When you talk about the possibility of having the European project being part of what could be the model for tomorrow at the global level, are you also thinking along the lines of uh, uh, Jürgen Habermas' uh, notion on uh, world domestic policy? Yeah, uh, that's maybe for a little bit later, but in principle, yes. I, uh, I think in, in principle that would be a, a very nice direction, a nice way to, to go in the distant future, maybe 22nd century, something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to go back to the uh, tension between mm -hmm. global justice and local justice, does it make sense to really, and I think of course it does, but how do we go about this, to pursue uh, uh, global justice while somehow justice at the, at the local level uh, is being undermined or under threat? Yeah, I mean, first of all, uh, it's not just justice at the local level, but also justice at the global level. So yeah. inequalities are rising locally, but they're also rising globally. And so in a sense, it's nice that we have this uh, burgeoning concern with justice just at the moment when it's needed, right? So in a sense, that's a good thing. Yeah, things are going in the wrong direction. The last 30 years have been a disaster for justice. I agree with that. Locally and globally, things have gone very badly in the wrong direction in most countries and in the world at large. But uh, that's exactly what we need justice for, to try to reverse that trend, uh, to try to raise consciousness, to make people aware of it. Now, the, the second thing is that, uh, that the local injustice that is clearly on the rise, as you say, is on the rise for reasons that in, have deep global roots. I think globalization is a very important element of this increase in uh, intranational inequality. And uh, the, I mean, two ways of looking at that. One way of looking at it is to say that as rules are shifting upwards, as more and more of the rules that govern, uh, let's say, economic transactions, financial markets, and so on, are made at the global or supranational level, the number of agents who can have meaningful influence on the shaping of this rule actually shrinks. Yeah. You would think that if the rules are made at a higher level, more people have influence. No, fewer people have influence. Uh, when there is a bill pending in the French parliament, uh, we know what to do. We know ahead of time what the bill is. We can weigh in, we can organize petitions, we can have uh, demonstrations and so on and so forth. If there is a treaty text pending at the supranational level, uh, you'd be very lucky to find out what it is before it gets announced as adopted. And it would be very difficult for you to influence in any meaningful way, for you or any citizen to influence in any meaningful way what goes on at, uh, in these in supranational negotiations. But who has an influence? Well, it's a very, very small group of very powerful corporations and industry associations and banks and so on. They know these things beforehand and they can lobby through the most powerful governments like the US, China and so on and really influence these negotiations. And their influence is almost unopposed because the rest of us, civil society, is essentially excluded even from knowing what's being negotiated, let alone from being able to have any kind of influence. So and that in turn, of course, means that when this very small group of powerful economic actors can design the global rules, the supranational rules, essentially as they please, then that uh, enables them to design them in a way that strengthens their economic position at the expense of those excluded. And these excluded include uh, the rest of the people in their own country uh, who are not at the table. So, for example, intellectual property rights are very heavily regulated by the WTO agreement. There's the TRIPS agreement, part of the WTO treaty, that says exactly what intellectual property rights protections countries have to adopt as a condition of membership in the WTO. Now look in the same WTO treaty and look for protections of workers, of people, you know, labor rights. Nothing there, right? That is left to the discretion of different countries. And so countries are forced into some race to the bottom sort of competition where they have to attract foreign capital by offering ever more exploitable and mistreatable Workforces, but, but in, in a way, this, Tom, this is not new. In a way, historically, you know, property rights in in Western capitalism have always been more protected than labor rights or human rights. Yeah, so that's right. The... But but that's right. But uh, in the at the in the national theater of decision making, uh, the 
ordinary workers had the possibility to resist against that, especially with universal suffrage, right? If things get too bad, you're, you're right. You know, American politics is dominated by big money and so on. I, I know that. That's completely right. But you can't screw the people over completely because they can still vote. And if you uh, drive them to despair, they will form new parties. They will resist through the political system. And all the money in the world is not going to help you in keeping the people down. So inequalities can only rise so far domestically. But at the global level, uh, there is a much freer hand and it's much harder for a large majority of human beings who are suffering from the effects of globalization to resist this imposition of global rules. So, so global justice requires a global polity in the context of which people would have a say and would, would be given the means to somehow control uh, the, the small elite. Yeah, that's right. So it, it requires that not uh, in any logical sense, but it requires that in the real sense of politics, right? If we allow global rules to be made by a very small elite of government representatives who basically do the bidding of the strongest lobbies in their own and sometimes foreign countries, then we cannot be surprised that the outcome is a highly unjust outcome that uh, completely disregards the interests of the vast majority of human beings. So we need to move from there to a system where the interests of the large majority of humankind are at least articulated in these negotiations, where at least somebody is at the table and says, look, if you go this way, if you do this without doing that, then the effect will be that several hundred million additional people will fall into poverty, that there will be food crises in Africa and so on, that at least the information is being looked at before things are adopted. But of course, even more important is that there are people at the table with a genuine voice and role and uh, the ability to negotiate and to vote who effectively represent this majority of humankind. And, and do you think that it is the case today? I mean, my answer would be no, but what is your answer to this? I mean, uh... well, it's not, not the case today. That was the point that I was making, that yes. we have nowhere near as much of a participation and representation of the interests of, let's say, the bottom 80% of the population in supranational negotiations and rulemaking as we do in most national negotiations and rulemaking. So how do we enhance the ways through which we can really increase uh, participation and accountability in the end? How do we do this? I think the only way to do it is uh, through the media and the people, right? Politicians are happy with the system as it is. Uh, the great corporations are happy with the system as it is because they have a monopoly on, on lobbying. So I think the, the key thing is to mobilize people and to make sure people understand that, for example, inequality is rising, that, for example, uh, the large majority, let's say the bottom 80, 90 percent of the U.S. population, haven't seen any improvement in their economic situation in the last 40 years or so. They're no better off than their parents and their grandparents were despite the fact that average income in the United States has written, risen quite nicely. But all these gains have gone to a very small elite at the top, and the fact that this small elite has managed to capture all this gain is, again, an effect of globalization. But, but, uh, but uh, yet, you know, the, the issues uh, uh, that you're putting on the table, uh, if you will, uh, as part of our conversation, are not really at the center of the public political discourse uh, uh, be it at the national level or at the global level. Somehow, you know, the politicians are not very uh, eager to talk about this, uh, and, and clearly they certainly don't have the answers uh, if they were eager to talk about it to these problems. Yeah, the politicians, as I said, the politicians like the system as it is. They basically get uh, large amounts of uh, money and other support from uh, the corporate corporations, corporate executives, and so on, and uh, basically so long as the people are uh, essentially acquiescing, are content with the system as it is. The politicians are not going to rock the boat, with a very few exceptions, of course. But uh, discontent is growing. I think there's a lot of discontent in the wake of the global financial crisis in the rich countries, where people are saying, you know, we have paid enormous amounts of tax money to bail out the banks and to bail out uh, even some of the, the great uh, economic institutions, the great businesses, the great corporations. And uh, we are suffering. We are uh, 
you know, large numbers of us are unemployed, large numbers of us have lost their savings, our uh, retirement is in jeopardy. And uh, do we really want to go on business as usual with uh, deregulation, with a very close nexus between a political and economic elite where people are often jumping back and forth from businesses to politics and from politics back into businesses, Goldman uh, Sachs or Halliburton are wonderful examples for the US. Do we really want to put up with this system any longer? And so I hope that there will be some resistance that will force uh, the, these uh, political economic elites in the rich countries to make uh, concessions and to give up some of this power that they are now wielding, both nationally and also at the supranational level. So, so this is the, the, the big picture uh, term on, on global justice. And perhaps as a way to finish our conversation, I would want to link what has been your intellectual trajectory with all these issues. I mean, you, you, you started uh, uh, many years ago uh, with a reading and critique of, of, of Rawls' theory of, of justice, at least uh, uh, of, of the international dimension of its, uh, of its theory. Then it seems to me that you worked on uh, identifying the principle and responsibilities of justice at the global level, in particular in connection with world, with world poverty. And now you are focusing on global justice in connection with uh, issues of health. So, you know, what led you to, to, to this journey and why is it that you are now focusing on, on health issues? Yeah, so uh, I started with Rawls uh, because I thought that he was a very important and widely revered theorist in the US context who really has managed to appeal to and to resonate with a lot of people in the uh, US intelligentsia. And I thought that some of the thoughts that he was introducing into the discussion were extremely useful to uh, in particular the focus on institutions, on the way a society is structured or organized would be uh, extremely useful for getting people to think in the right way also about global institutional arrangements and how these arrangements are extremely important for uh, the way in which uh, economic inequality is developing over time and so on. Uh, I was then uh, increasingly interested in uh, issues of poverty because I saw uh, the economy, the importance of the economy uh, also for uh, winning all sorts of other human rights. It's very difficult for people to be respected in the political sphere, in the social sphere, uh, for their civil rights to be respected if they are very poor and very dependent on uh, people who are richer than themselves. And so I think it, uh, one has to, and it's also very difficult to uh, shape rules in the political arena in a way that conforms to justice if uh, the economic power is so unequally distributed that a few people can essentially dictate the terms under which everybody lives. So I saw the economy as increasingly important and I thought that it was uh, important if one wanted to make progress towards a theory and also practice of global justice to think more about uh, why it is that inequality is increasing, that poverty is not declining and so on and that uh, so many people are excluded from political decision making. Uh, the health focus uh, came in through a number of things. It was historically very contingent. I spent a year at the National Institutes of Health and just got interested in health issues. But it is, uh, in a way, a, a very important part of that uh, vi vicious cycle that keeps so many people from having a worthwhile human life that they are poor because they are poor, they are vulnerable to disease. Because they are poor, they can then not cope with the disease. They cannot go to the doctor. They cannot get the right medications. And also, they become poorer as a consequence of being sick, of not being able to work, or of being uh, forced to stay home to look after a, a child that may be deadly ill, and so on. And so the health, uh, or disease, I should say, is a very important part of the poverty nexus. And we who are relatively well off, and you know, the worst that happens to us every year we get a cold or something like that, uh, we just don't realize how important an issue health is for the bottom half of the human population. And I also uh, just uh, chanced upon this wonderful idea of the Health Impact Fund of sort of uh, using that as a project where I thought that progress is really possible because the Health Impact Fund is a reform project. Uh, based, the basic idea here is that we should uh, 
reward the introduction of new medicines, not by giving the introducer a monopoly patent so that they can sell the medicine at a very, very high price for the first 15 years or so that it's on the market, but rather we should reward the introducer of a new medicine uh, on the basis of the health impact that this medicine achieves on condition that the introducer sells the medicine everywhere at the cost of production. So that's the basic idea. And I think it's a wonderful idea. It's a, a wonderful win-win where really truly everybody can benefit from a new way of incentivizing pharmaceutical innovation. It's also something that would uh, improve the image of the pharmaceutical industry and so on. And it could serve as a model that we could then, if we achieve this, use in other areas, for example, in the area of seeds or in the area of green and green technologies uh, to uh, have similar win-win reforms that would uh, allow the poor to participate in the latest technologies without in any way harming rich people who pay for the introduction of these technologies. It doesn't cost anything to allow people to have these technologies so long as they pay for the sheer cost of production of uh, you know, the, the per unit cost of medicines, for example. A few months ago, I was reading your, your last book, and uh, in the book, you, 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 you mentioned the fact that very often your colleagues in the field of philosophy tell you that it's not really proper for philosophers to, 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 to work on practical issues. Uh, so why do you feel that it is uh, part of your mission, part of your responsibility to really try to connect uh, uh, academic concerns, theoretical concerns, and, and very practical concerns? Well, there are two answers to that. You know, one answer is uh, related to the, your very first question in this interview, when you said, you know, what is justice? And what is justice? Uh, philosophers tend to answer that question by giving you a string of other highfalutin words. And then you have a nice, colorful Christmas tree of high-level concepts, philosophical concepts, and they are explained, one in terms of all the others, but in the end, you don't really know what the whole Christmas tree of concept really means in the real world. And so if you really want to answer the question seriously, the question of what is justice, then you have to bring these concepts down to earth. You don't have to define them merely in terms of one another, but you have to pin them down and have to say, okay, so what would count as a society that satisfies the first principle of justice uh, by Rawls? Uh, how many uh, crimes, let's say, in what uh, composition of victims and so on would be compatible with saying that physical integrity is fulfilled in the United States today and so on. So you have to ask these questions. It's not questions, these are not questions that economists or lawyers or anybody else can answer. Philosophers have to bring their abstract theorizing down to earth as a condition of even saying something meaningful, of even saying, you know, what does it mean uh, this principle that you have just enunciated. So that's one answer, that I think it's an inherent need for philosophy to be meaningful, that it comes down from the ivory tower and at least says in clear operational terms that ordinary people can understand what it would mean for justice to be realized according to this, that, or the other theory of justice. Now the second point I want to make is that uh, traditionally justice has been conceived as the love of wisdom, that's the root, the Greek root of the term. And when you think about what wisdom is, I would say wisdom just is understanding what really matters, what's really important. And understanding what's really important in this world in which we are living now means understanding that uh, the great moral deficits, the great human rights deficits that we have are really important. It matters that so many people are not participating in technological progress that despite the fact that the average income is in the world today is, is very healthy, it's very high, uh, it, nevertheless it's around $10,000 per person per year, nevertheless uh, half the world's population are essentially excluded. They have only 3% of global household income and so have a tiny fraction of the average income. Poverty today, and that is in contrast to poverty uh, throughout the ages, poverty today is quite easily avoidable without much cost to anyone, and it is really important to avoid it. We should not be privileged in the rich countries and privileged also in some of the poor countries. 
we should stop living at the expense of large numbers of people. And this is important if we want to lead lives that are morally decent and worthwhile. And, and, so and here I feel is. that, and meaningful, that's right. And so here I want to say that it is in the best tradition of philosophy, if a philosopher goes to the rest of the world and says, look, uh, I'm a philosopher. I'm supposed to think about what is really important and what you all really ought to be looking at and thinking about, especially the kinds of things that you're not already paying attention to. And here's one thing that I think you absolutely have to pay attention to, and that is the fact that through the institutions that we maintain at the global level, we are killing millions of people every year. This is important, and you ought to be attention, pay attention to it. And I think that is just very much continuous with the role that philosophers have played since ancient times. So for you, focusing or bringing together theoretical concerns and practical concerns is a way to really make the life of, of uh, all these people in need more meaningful, but it's also, it's also a way for people who are more who are in, in a lucky position to, to make them, their, their own life more meaningful, because if you are uh, among the lucky ones and you don't care, you know, the, the very meaning of your life is, at, uh, is in question. Absolutely, yeah. You will then have lived at the expense of other people and so on. And uh, even if you lived tolerably happily in a subjective sense, you would have lived a bad life. And at least people should understand that. They should know about it. And I think it is uh, continuous with the traditional role of the philosopher to be the one who at least puts that on the table, on the agenda, and says this is something that you should at least think about. So a quest for, uh, uh, in a way, a meaningful happiness. Yeah, that's right. Final question, Tom, and then I will let you go. Um, you know, as, as, as for the way ahead, uh, what are the questions you think you will be working in, in 10 years from now? And that is to say, what are the questions uh, on which you think we will still have to, to, to think, uh, you know, uh, in, in 2021? I mean, you know, of course, there will be plenty of it, but I mean, what is going to be uh, your agenda 10 years down the road uh, in, in the context of, of, of your uh, concerns? Yeah, so I will uh, probably remain for the rest of my life in this broad orbit of global justice questions, uh, but I want to get into some other important issues other than the ones that I've already worked upon. And, uh, but... On the other hand, I also want uh, to see through that health impact fund, uh, baby, if at all possible. So I see two possible futures 10 years down the road. Uh, it's possible that I will still be involved in the fight to get the health impact fund up and going, and uh, hopefully will be much closer to its realization then, or I, for all I know, I may even be involved in setting it up. I may play a role in that, even though... I may not be, you know, obviously one needs people from many different disciplines and with many expertises to set something like that up. So it's possible, and if, uh, if for the rest of my life all I achieve is to help with getting the Health Impact Fund up and running, uh, that would not be, you know, I would uh, be quite happy with that achievement. But on the other hand, it's also possible that uh, the Health Impact Fund, for one reason or another, that project will uh, go along its happy path uh, and I become more and more superfluous because other people take over and other tasks will have to be uh, fulfilled. And in that case, there are two areas in which I want to play a stronger role. And one is uh, illicit financial flows, which I think is an extremely important topic. Very, very large amounts of money uh, uh, being sloshing around a, an intransparent banking system a system of tax havens and secrecy jurisdictions where monies are hidden. And often, of course, these monies come straight out of the pockets of poor people. These are monies that are siphoned off in poor countries through tax avoidance, through embezzlement, and so on, and then parked in illicit uh, locations, often with the connivance of uh, Western banks or even in Western banks and with the connivance of Western governments. So I want to shine a bright spotlight on that because that strikes me as another win-win proposition. Most people in the rich countries, most taxpayers, are losing money because of these opportunities to hide monies. And of course, the poor countries are losing massive amounts of money in that way. And again, here I think a grand coalition can be formed uh, with prudential and moral interests uh, included uh, to dry up this terrible morass and to stabilize our global financial system and at the same time to make sure that the burdens of government 
are also shared by many of the people who are now uh, putting their money aside into these secret accounts. Uh, the second thing would be uh, resource depletion, pollution, climate change, that nexus, where again, I find that there are wonderful opportunities because many people, uh, many especially young people in both poor and rich countries are seeing that this is increasingly a problem that will affect their generation and the generations that come after them. And uh, again, there's a lot of uh, potential mobilization that I can maybe contribute to by articulating the concerns, by channeling them in a direction that makes the politically more effective, by unifying people behind a common platform. So again, that's a global justice issue par excellence and one uh, to which I hope in future years to contribute as well. But it will mean uh, uh, you know, retraining yourself, expanding your field of knowledge, uh, learning about uh, new areas. So what gives you the energy, the, the drive to, to, to work so hard? Uh, the, the energy comes simply from the emergency, right? We are living in a world in which uh, so much uh, injustice happens, in which so much harm is suffered by people, and uh, I feel that uh, if you want to call it sacrifices, the sacrifices that I'm making, running around the universe, working very hard, barely taking any vacation time, are minuscule. I mean, ridiculously small compared to the fate of so many poor people. So it would be pretty ridiculous for me to say, look, it's more important that I now have a three-week vacation somewhere in the sun. Uh, and if the Health Impact Fund, the chances of getting that adopted or the chances of global justice are thereby diminished, that's not so bad. I mean, it would be an absurd prioritization. So long as uh, I am uh, healthy and have uh, my intellectual wits about me, I will work on this as hard as I can and then hope that others will uh, take over when uh, I collapse from exhaustion.